This is the Roots and All podcast, and I'm your host, Sarah Wilson. Join me as I talk about all aspects of gardening with some of the top horticulturists from around the world. Hello, and welcome to this episode of the podcast, where I'm speaking with Seb Straub. Seb is based at Leeds University and is part of the Ecology and Evolution Group, where his research looks at many different topics, including botany, freshwater ecology, ecosystem structures, and urban landscapes. He recently co-authored a research paper which looks at the state of botanical education, and that's what I was particularly interested in chatting about today. Seb begins by describing his work. I'm final year PhD student at the University of Leeds. Um, I work in the Hassel Lab, and we're a bit of a, a mixed bunch, really, with the kind of spatial ecology, freshwater, all the way through to wildlife trade um, and insect decline. So we've got some really cool projects going on using weather radar to monitor insect populations. Um, myself, I am a freshwater ecologist, um, botanist, um, social science, so real interdisciplinary bag. Broadly speaking, urban ecology is is mostly what I focus on. Um, but then a lot of my recent research interests have revolved around kind of environmental, particularly botanical pedagogy and kind of enhancing botanical and plant literacy within higher education. Excellent. And I came across your work because I saw a paper that you'd written called The Botanical Education Extinction and the Fall of Plant Awareness. And I wondered if you could maybe talk about this extinction of botanical education and why. I I guess it's a very broad question, but if you could maybe give your take on why you think that is happening nowadays. I mean, it all stemmed, if you'll excuse the pun, from a workshop that we put on um, with the uh, British Ecological Society called Tackling the Roots of Plant Blindness. Um, It was organised by um, one of my supervisors, Julie Peacock, here at Leeds, and then also Dr Karen Bacon from University of Galway. And it was a a kind of half-day symposium, and we brought together practitioners, educators, researchers from all over the world um, to talk about kind of, I guess, key issues in botanical education. And with some discussions um, with some of the keynote speakers um, who were Dr. Susie Lydon, um, who's a paleo botanist from Nottingham, and Dr. Jonathan Mitchley, and also uh, Mark Fennell, who works at ACOM. Within certain spheres, there's been this kind of concern or underlying worry that we are losing good botany from our degrees. And we decided, okay, well, let's get some empirical data on it. We looked at student recruitment, um, and then we looked at the number of degrees, the modules that are offered, um, the number of graduates that were coming out with degrees related to plant science, plant biology. And we we kind of identified that actually within higher education teaching within the biological sciences, there's very little plant identification and plant ecology content that is taught to our students and um, we then identified okay so so we we see a, a decrease in content what does that look like in terms of student numbers i guess i'll also ask you a question as of how many botany graduates have we had within the last decade and I'll, I'll give you something to compare that with which is how many bioscience graduates have we had and that's about a hundred thousand in the last 10 years and so our students are sometimes just say okay well is it ten thousand maybe seven thousand five thousand a thousand or so and actually, the reality is it's less than a thousand. So it's about seven hundred or so. So we've had seven hundred plant biologists graduate within the last decade. So they're absolutely dwarfed by the general biosciences by about by about two hundred to one. So that's a really stark disparity. I mean, that's not the whole picture. Like where we have plant science degrees and other degrees as well, we also have teaching on plant science and plant ecology. But what we found was that actually there were relatively few modules that were encompassing kind of whole plant, whole organism, plant ecology content, even within plant biology, plant science degrees. And of course, there is no botany degree in the UK anymore. The last botany degree took its uh, last student in about a decade ago. And since then, they are now all plant science and plant biology, which is fine. You know, that is just a name for a program. But it was the content that we were concerned with. And um, we found that some plant biology, plant science degrees, actually have no plant identification modules associated with them. And they tend to be very much more focused on cellular processes, um, plant biochemistry. And the concern is there is that actually to have a really holistic understanding of how plants work, you need to understand plant ecology in relation to their 
biochemistry and their kind of interactions with the world as well. So we're kind of worried about this real skills gap that could be emerging within our biology graduates. So that's kind of how we first kind of identified what we called the botanical education extinction. And we think that could have some really profound impacts. There's been quite a few reports that have been released. Um, so the Scottish government have said that they, they don't think they have this capacity within their workforce to kind of meet nature recovery um, and to implement nature-based solutions. The Australian agricultural sector is really worried about meeting future food demand, especially under kind of climate change. And in the US, it's something like half of current botanists are expected to retire with that replacement. Um, so it, it could be a really concerning landscape in the future. So there's a couple of things out of that. One is a really important point that you made, which is that even if these things are being taught, sometimes they are not taught to the level that you might expect. And I was really struck by your statistic, which I think was that only 14% of students who were taking A-level biology could actually name more than three native UK plant species. But the other thing that, as you were talking then, Talking about plants and how they fit into society and ecology as a whole, maybe we are in just a bit of a state of flux because I guess there were traditional ways of looking at how plants fit in with basically human lives and the rest of the natural world, which I feel is changing. And I'm saying this because I'm currently reading a book called Fresh Banana Leaves, which is about indigenous science and how indigenous people work with the land and plants. And I'm wondering if maybe that's something that might be explored in the future or could be a springboard for other ways of studying plants that we maybe previously haven't and that perhaps at the moment we are just as I say in a state of flux and a state of change in terms of the education around plants. I think something that's really important to say is that in, you know indigenous communities are absolutely vital in protecting biodiversity. Indigenous land encompasses a huge amount of our conservation areas. Um, their practices are used and they conserve biodiversity in a way. I think it's also really interesting you were mentioning Indigenous knowledge. And I sometimes think that actually, we, like you say, state of flux, we may be actually coming around back to a more holistic understanding of natural history. For a long time, we've been quite reductionist about how we look at things. And perhaps now the academic community is acknowledging actually that there are much broader benefits to kind of nature literacy and, and looking at cultural, spiritual contexts to nature around us as well. So I, I, I think Perhaps in future, we will move more to that way. But it's also linked into kind of higher education and educational processes and what universities prioritise. Myself and my colleagues have noted that actually sometimes things like field courses, which are absolutely fantastic for going out and connecting students with the, their native ecology, uh, wildlife around them, they can be quite expensive to put on. They have quite a lot of associated risk assessments. They're very time intensive for staff. And that's not to say that staff don't love putting them on. But in terms of the financial cost of them, that's quite a big burden for universities. And I am sometimes concerned that perhaps in the interest of saving money, those might be the kind of modules or activities that might be lost in future. So, I, I mean, one of the most important things when we're, we're engaging people with nature and teaching nature literacy is to get people in the field and to get them looking at not just plants but all wildlife because plants are wildlife in the natural environment um, and not even the natural environment i run an urban ecology field course we talk about the value that uh, wildlife provides to us within urban areas and that can be everything from ecosystem services like carbon capture pollution removal all the way through to those kind of cultural and spiritual benefits that they have Hopefully, we are going to see a, a, a much greater level of awareness about how plants are valuable to society. I don't know if our current academic framework is set up for that yet, which I think might lead us nicely on to talking about the new natural history GCSE that's been developed. Yes, I think it does. That was going to be my very next question. Tell me about that and how that is maybe of concern in terms of, as you said, equity and accessibility. Yeah, so there was talk between myself and some other colleagues that we don't fully know what the curriculum is going to be for the Natural History GCSC. Um, and that's not a concern in of itself. But what we're really keen to understand and hopefully engage with again at some point is that it has a foundation, a kind of core ecological knowledge that people need to know. And plants are essential for that. Through an understanding of your local flora, you can understand the geology, you can understand 
soil structure, soil depth, you can understand kind of local ecological processes. So when you give somebody a botanical education that is holistic, they can read the landscape in a very different way. I always say to my master's students when they come to our plant identification module, I'm saying, I'm, I'm really sorry, but a walk down the street is never going to be the same for you anymore because you're going to pick out all of those species that you've never noticed before. And you're going to say, that's unusual. Oh, look at that growing in that location. You know, I can tell this about that, this particular area. I know that this bench is really commonly frequented by dogs because it's covered in dog piss grass. So all of these kind of interesting ecological features you can pick up really quickly with a good understanding of plants. So we're really keen to make sure that that's a kind of core component of the natural history GCSC. One of the, the concerns that was raised was that it could potentially be seen as a quote unquote soft GCSC. Not that I think that any GCSEs are soft, they, they all provide useful knowledge to those students who want to engage them and useful skills. We're not entirely sure what it's going to encompass yet in the natural history GCSC, but it should not be seen as a soft GCSC. The skills that you learn from studying natural history and natural science are really valuable. Data collection, data analysis, interpretation, those are really essential skills for any student. But what we wouldn't want to see is that it is primarily focused on kind of charismatic animals, not just birds and mammals. It should be really encompassing. So it should be plants, it should be mosses, it should be lichens, it should be not just pollinators, but all sorts of different invertebrates as well, through to those vertebrate taxa as well. And I, the other concern as well is how accessible is this GCSE going to be? Now, urban ecology is really important. It's what I study and it is doable, but actually, are we going to have educators who are well equipped to teach that? We have the botanical education extinction. Most of the bioscience graduates who come out will probably not have received that much plant ecology. So are we going to have educators who are going to be equipped to make that really interesting and dynamic? And if not, how can we support them? That's the next question from that. The second thing is, like we said, it can be quite costly. Putting on field trips to nature reserves, it takes a lot of logistics. It also takes money. So ensuring that that's accessible to students of all backgrounds is really important. And it would be a travesty if it wasn't. Again, I don't know what the plan for natural history GCSE is yet. Um, I don't think it's, it's due to be released until 2025. And I'm not sure when the final curriculum is going to be released either. But making sure that it's holistic is just really critical, especially in the face of nature recovery, where actually plants who provide those fundamental ecological processes is really critical. Mm, the key, obviously, as you said, is that holistic component of it. And also what you touch on in your paper that I was reading is the impacts of how we deal with climate change and I think also food security and even our economy just in the UK. So this dearth of skills and knowledge is really going to impact on society at large. Is that fair to say? When we look at kind of nature recovery, I think things are improving. We are getting much better awareness, but certain activities can be rolled out with really good intentions, but actually can be really ecologically disastrous. So we've seen, you know, species rich wildflower meadows planted with trees, which will fundamentally change the ecology of that site, reducing biodiversity, um, reducing the amount of habitat we have for those grassland species. We've seen tree planting on um, peatlands, which is actually going to likely be a net carbon loss, i.e. carbon will be released as you plant a tree onto peat soils, it sucks up a lot of water um, that dries out that peat soil, makes it friable, opens it up to more microbial activity, which can then release more carbon. So what we often say is the wrong plant in the wrong place could be just as damaging as not doing anything at all, if not more so. In terms of food security, I mean, at the moment, Southern Europe is in a massive heat wave. Climate change is going to reduce food yields massively. We're already seeing climate migration and um, climate refugees as well, where food crops have failed, coupled with extreme weather events. But plants provide a myriad of different solutions. So the, the amazing thing about plants is, unlike animals, they can't get up and go somewhere else if conditions aren't favourable. So they have these amazing kind of genetic toolboxes to switch on and off genes to adapt to those conditions. So where botanical training and taxonomy and plant ecology is really essential is we can look at things like wild crop relatives. So finding wild crop relatives such as, so if we look at, say, the Solanaceae, um, who are 
our tomatoes and nightshades, um, there's a huge diversity of different Solanaceae. They're a, a mega diverse family. Um, and within the species we have there, we're going to have all sorts of interesting genes that we're going to be able to, to use to improve food security, to improve you know, resilience to heat stress, to improve yields, to improve disease resistance. So being able to identify what plants we have, areas of high plant biodiversity where there could be those useful genetic resources and plant resources as well for kind of new crops is really essential. Being able to protect those and identify those is, is a, just an absolutely essential skill in, in, in climate resilience. Also understanding the ecology of species. We are going to see shifts in vegetation and species range. So understanding where future tree planting and habitat restoration is appropriate is really essential. So that's where we need to understand fundamental species ecology. We're not going to be able to manage our environments in the same way as we have historically. We have to build in resilience and adaptation to them. What shocks me, I think, is that we are very much seen as a nation of garden lovers and mm -hmm. wildlife nature lovers in this country. I don't know how we compare with the rest of the world in terms of losing our botanical education, but certainly even if we're kind of on par, it still surprises me that as a nation with this kind of reputation that we've let this slide and disappear. Have you got any thoughts about why that's happened? Yeah, I mean, it's interesting. So uh, I must say about the paper is that not everyone agreed with us, which that's great. You know, opening up discourse is really important. We had a really overwhelming response from the paper. And you know, I had emails from people all the way in Australia, all the way from South America, Brazil, America, Mexico, just all over the world. And what struck me was that a lot of people did agree. They said that we've seen a real decline and a, and a loss of kind of botanical education within higher education. But actually, there are also areas where they have really upped their game. So actually, we're seeing a lot of really good taxonomy research coming out from China in Japan and Korea. Every couple of days, I'm seeing a new paper coming out on a new species being identified from that region. So there are still really active areas of research. Some people will disagree and say actually that we have a really thriving botanical communities. There's, there's also an interesting debate about what is botany versus plant science versus plant biology, which is slightly contentious and so not everyone agrees. I would say that botany is a really broad church and anyone who studies plants in some capacity is a botanist. Some might not agree, but I, I think to be a good botanist, you also need to understand plant genetics, plant cellular processes, plant biochemistry. And so that's why we need to give this holistic botanical education. And uh, it's not that I'm interested in seeing another botany degree in the UK, but degrees having good botany. I think is really essential. Reading your paper again made me think about the natural history GCSE. Somebody somewhere who's in charge of purse strings had to decide that that was a good use of, I'm assuming, government money. So there's been then this presumably kind of drawing back or funding from certain parts around botany. Do you feel that there are changes being made top down so that we will see these kind of things become more common and this type of education become better funded, really? It's difficult to say. I mean, there was a report that was released around 2010 on the state of taxonomy in the UK. And at that point, it kind of stated that taxonomy was in critical decline and that the urgent action was needed. 13 years later, taxonomy is still in critical decline and urgent funding is needed. So in some regards, no. There are other factors, you know, we've had global recessions, we've had the pandemic. There is more money for nature recovery. We are really seeing good actions, not just in the UK, but globally. So various countries have been investing really heavily within sustainability. So China has invested huge amounts of money in, in water quality and pollution reduction, also renewable energies. We also are seeing that here in the UK. In terms of education, I don't know that I'm so hopeful. UK education is vastly unfunded at the moment. You know, we're seeing that with current strikes that we're having, especially also within higher education as well, and the strikes that my colleagues are currently participating in. It's a really difficult landscape. I think a lot of plant ecology and botany training that's done in the UK is done by more specialist organisations. So the BSBI or Plant Life or the Field Studies Council all run really fantastic courses for people wanting to get into botany or to specialise. In terms of early careers education, Q are doing a lot of work with things like Grow Wild and Love Plants and things like that. Dreadfully, I'm a bit of a pessimist. So 
I'm not sure that I feel so positive, but I, I hope kind of in highlighting this case and doing a lot of good public engagement. And also I, I organized and helped to organize something called Botanical University Challenge, where we bring together plant aware students that we are starting to make inroads. At some point, we're hoping to get to parliament and kind of present some of our findings um, and get some more active discussions in the political sphere. More funding is always great, but actually there are a lot of challenges at the moment in terms of adult social care, climate change. Where do we fit into that? I'm not sure. And you are doing fantastic work and I wish you the best of luck. And maybe it's like a tanker turning around, perhaps. I guess that's the positive spin on it, you know, that change is coming, but it, it's going to take a while. Yeah. And you're at the coalface seeing it every day and seeing all the challenges. So as I say, you're doing an amazing job. So thank well, you thank, for that. I mean, we are making progress here at Leeds. When I started my PhD, we had one plant identification module, um, which was for the master's cohort. We now have an introductory one within their first year for biosciences. And then we also have this dedicated urban ecology field course where they have a whole plant identification and ecology component. So we're making really good inroads here at Leeds, at least. Like I said, I run Botanical University Challenge. Um, we just had our first student botany conference, which was literally a couple of weeks ago. Um, so we had almost 100 students from different institutions across the UK all meeting engaging, talking about the future of the science and their community. So there are some really positive actions happening. The Natural History GCSE has the opportunity to be absolutely fantastic and, you know, revolutionary. And it's definitely what we need. I'm just really keen to see what direction it goes on. The other thing I, we also talked about, I didn't really summarise this, but about the UK being a, a nation of garden and wildlife lovers. And this is a weird sometimes dichotomy, I think, because the UK horticultural industry is huge, billions and billions and billions. But in terms of funding for our natural plants, relatively little. And we've seen some really kind of catastrophic declines. So this year, the BSBI released their new plant atlas, and they found that over 50% of native British plant species are declining. So there's some really worrying statistics there. Things are also improving. You know, we are seeing better local management or green spaces, so parks, road verges, um, urban freshwaters, things like that. So we've seen things like relaxed mowing regimes to allow um, more kind of grassland plants to establish. Um, so you've probably had no mow May. It should really be no mow May, June, July. But so hopefully we can start to get those kind of messages across as well um, and have kind of more rough and slightly wild areas within our urban matrix, which would be fantastic. There's always kind of a bit of pushback against that. People say that it's just local councils trying to save money, which yes, it is. It's great. You can save money doing that. But I, I think it's really essential for nature recovery. We know that grasslands can suck up a lot of carbon as well while providing a whole range of different benefits to us and, and wildlife. I think the only other thing I'd like to say is that a botanical career is so rewarding and that if there are young people who aren't sure what they want to do with their life. I want to go to amazing places and work with fantastic people and see fabulous wildlife and do world changing research. Botany is the way to go. Uh, we say in our paper that, you know, the pathway to a sustainable future is through the power of plants. And I am such a firm believer in that. They have this absolutely transformational quality to them. We could develop such a fantastic ecological society, but we just need people to really step up to that and we've got so many people doing fantastic work but put pressure on local government engage with whatever opportunities come there's so many um, and there's lots of funding available as well for young people who want to get out and learn about plants through the bsbi through other charities as well and join the bsbi you know fantastic organization they'll do local field meetings where you can be with some of the best botanists in the country and receive fantastic education completely for free you know you can pay 500 pounds for a plant id course sometimes um, but yet you can go on your local BSBI meeting and have the same tutor for three hours. So engage as much as possible. They do fantastic work. Well, I'm not sure about you, but I'm very tempted to sign up to study with Seb. If you are interested in finding out more about his work, there are links to his research paper, the course he mentioned and his Twitter and more in the show notes and on the website. Thank you to Seb for taking time out to speak about this important topic and to you as well for listening. This week's shout out to a good person with a good business is the incredibly talented, creative and socially and culturally switched on Carolyn Willits, who runs CW Studio, a landscape architect practice in Manchester. You can find Carolyn at cwstudio.co.uk.
There's a link in the show notes. And if you have no need of a landscape architect, give Carolyn a follow anyway on Instagram because she is always doing something interesting. Here's Dr. Ian Bedford now with a lowdown on a fuzzy little so-and-so. Commonly referred to as green fly or black fly, depending on their colour, are the aphids. Small, sap-sucking plant bugs of which there are over 500 species in Britain. And while some of these will be polyphagous, feeding on a wide range of plants, most others will be monophagous, feeding on just one plant type or a few that are closely related. And this is the case for the woolly apple aphid, which only feeds and breeds on apple, pyracantha and cotoneaster trees, all of which belong to the rose family. Woolly apple aphids are common throughout Britain, and many people will have them in their gardens. Well, they'll become active during spring, after spending winter within nooks and crannies on their host tree. And as the weather warms, they'll constantly feed on sap through the bark and will soon create colonies of aphids by continuously giving birth to live young. And whilst doing so, they'll also be secreting copious amounts of fluffy wax, which completely covers the colony, not only shielding it from the harmful effects of sun, rain and wind, but protecting it from predators. However, The mass of wax, which resembles mould on the trunk and branches of infested trees, makes it very easy for us to see where the aphid colonies are, which is quite useful if they need to be controlled within an apple orchard or on a cherished tree in the garden, which might well be necessary, since besides the messy appearance of woolly apple aphids, it unfortunately causes a more serious problem. Because as the aphids feed, they dispense a chemical with their saliva that causes lumpy growths to develop on the tree. Growths that are softer than the surrounding bark and therefore easier for the aphids to feed through, but growths that often swell and split, allowing fungal canker disease to establish. Controlling woolly aphids, though, is relatively simple if the infestations are accessible and won't require using a chemical insecticide that could harm the beneficial creatures that are on the trees, whether it's organic or not, since it just involves removing the wax layer that the colony has produced, uncovering and exposing the delicate aphids to the elements and to their predators, something that is easily achieved by thoroughly spraying the infested areas with a proprietary soap-based treatment, one that has been tested and approved for its environmental and plant safety. You can download or listen to the podcast direct from the website rootsandall.co.uk. Please also check out my Patreon, where you can make a one-off donation or take out a monthly subscription to help support the podcast. Because if you enjoy the show, please help it continue. I also have a GoFundMe where you can make a one-off donation. Even a one-off donation of £1 helps, and I'll be really grateful for your support. So please go to Patreon or GoFundMe and search for Roots and All Podcast.